This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. And when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find there tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. And so they went away, and they found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. And then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. And then those who went ahead and those who followed behind were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The gospel of the Lord. And so, Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, we pray that we would hear not just the words of men, but the words of God. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I want to take that as my text this morning from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. And if you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 1007. Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, and beginning at verse 1. And this morning, I want to talk about hanging with Jesus when the going gets tough. <laughs> hanging with Jesus when the going gets tough gets tough. Indeed, to hanging with Jesus and being faithful to him when things are going good is one thing, but hanging with Jesus and being faithful to him when the going gets tough is another thing altogether. And something to keep in mind is that Palm Sunday, as we now call it, and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem wasn't, in fact, the beginning of something good although it may very much seem like that. And for those of, uh, who only do Palm Sunday and then come to Easter Day the following Sunday, who coast customarily skip Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, this misunderstanding, this misunderstanding is especially ingrained that Palm Sunday is the start of a good thing. But truth be told, Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem wasn't a good thing. Rather, it was the beginning of things turning especially tough uh, for Jesus. In fact, uh, Fleming Rutledge has written, with the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem at its start, Holy Week begins in triumph and ends in catastrophe. Indeed, after the triumphal entry, everything pretty much heads downhill for Jesus. As Jesus himself had been saying all along, that that would be the case. In fact, in Mark chapter 10, and beginning at verse 32, and this, by the way, is the third time that he mentions it, because he mentions it in chapter 8, he mentions it in chapter 9. This is the last time he mentions it. But we read there, beginning at verse 32, and Jesus and the crowd that was following him were on the road going to Jerusalem. This would be his last visit, by the way. And taking the twelve aside, Jesus began to tell them again what, what, what was going to happen to him, saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise again. 
or later in that same chapter, and Jesus said, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so then we come to our text in chapter 11. Mark says, beginning at verse 1, And when Jesus and the crowd that was following him drew near to Jerusalem, now they're close. In fact, they're only just a couple miles away. And came to Bethphage, which means house of figs. I guess at Bethphage they planted figs and harvested figs. And Bethany at the Mount of Olives. In fact, Beth. Phage and, uh, uh, and Bethany are the last two villages located on the Jericho Road, the road that leads, led from Jericho up to Jerusalem at an elevation of 2,500 feet, and, and with Jericho being below sea level. <laughs> but to here they come to these last two uh, uh, villages on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives, just some two miles, as I said, from Jerusalem. And Jerusalem being located on the western side of the Mount of Olives with the Kidron Valley, which was not they call it a, a valley. It's not very, very far. I've walked across it on foot. It's no big deal. But Mark says, and when Jesus and the crowd that was following him, drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, which would presumably be Bethphage because that was the one that you came to first and then Bethany is the last village on the road. And immediately, Jesus said, when you enter it, you'll find a colt tied. And this is, we know, by comparing with the other gospel writers, a donkey colt as we have it in Matthew and John. And Jesus said, uh, and this is a colt that no one has, on, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it, he said, and, and bring it here. Now, in the ancient world, horses were usually associated with power and with war. But a donkey in the ancient world, and especially in Palestine and amongst the Jews, was a symbol of peace. And a donkey colt on which no one had ever ridden would have been a symbol of peace and even more so. In fact, what's happening here is, if, if you like, the fulfillment of what the prophet Zechariah said. In Zechariah 9, and beginning at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so we read in verse 1, and Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat, untie it and bring it to me. And Jesus continues in verse 3, and if anyone says to you, and of course, that's exactly what we would expect, that somebody would say, what are you doing? If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Then say, the Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. Verse 4, and so they went away and they found a colt tied out at a door outside in the street. It was, it was right there as they entered the village. They didn't have to go on a search, you know, hey, have you seen, a, you know, a colt? <laughs> it was right there, and they untied it, and some of this, those who were standing by said, what are you doing untying the colt? That's not yours. And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. In verse 7, and they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, making something of a saddle, a seat. And Jesus sat on it. And then a procession started. And somewhere near Bethphage, going along the road, past or through Bethany, and then over the top and down the western slope of the Mount of Olives, which is at an elevation 200 feet higher than Jerusalem itself. Jerusalem at an elevation of 2,500, the top of Mount, the Mount of Olives, 2,700. I've stood on, on that mountain and when you stand on it, on its western slope, and toward the top, you can see all of Jerusalem. 
And now you look down on what was the Temple Mount, and there is the Dome of the Rock. But in Jesus' day, there would have been the temple and all of its golden glory and people there in the, in the temple precincts and smoke going up from the offerings that were being made. And people on, in the courts of the temple could look back and see what was coming down the side of the Mount of Olives. And then through the Kidron Valley and into Jerusalem, and Mark says in verse 8, and then many spread their cloaks on the road as, a, as an act of, of, of personal sacrifice. Can you imagine that? You know, that's why we have red carpets now, because we don't like uh, dignitaries walking on our clothes. <clears throat> but they took off their outer cloak and said, here, walk on this. In recognition of Jesus' royal dignity. And before their very eyes, the, the words of Zechariah the prophet is being fulfilled. Indeed, listen again to what the prophet wrote. Zechariah 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Mark says, verse 8, and many spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields and those who went before <laughs> and those who followed after with Jesus and the colts somewhere there in the middle. They were shouting, Hosanna, <laughs> which in the Hebrew means save now, Lord. <laughs> But over time, it probably had just become something of an explanation of, of joy. And in this case, an, a, a word of welcome, Hosanna. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom coming of our father David, which is a clear messianic reference. The Messiah is David's son. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest, our, because it's in the plural, we would say in the highest places, which is, a, practically speaking, an invitation to the angels of heaven to rejoice together with us. <laughs> And Mark says in verse 11, And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve, which was probably served as a base of operations. Of course, Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived in Bethany. And so a base of operations for the last week of his life. And so there you have it, Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem and the beginning of Holy Week, as we now call it. And the thing to keep in mind is that Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem isn't in fact the beginning of something good. Rather, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem is the beginning of things turning especially rough for Jesus, just as he had been saying all along. Indeed, even though Peter and all of the other disciples pledged their undying loyalty to Jesus, when Jesus was arrested in the garden On the Mount of Olives, on the Thursday next, Mark tells us in chapter 14 of his gospel in verse 30, they all left him and fled. Indeed, it's interesting. Now, you might have expected them to say this, but none of them did. Well, now if you're going to arrest him, you're going to have to arrest me too. No one said that. No, Mark says they all fled and left him. 
I wonder what would you have done if you had been there in the garden when Jesus was being arrested? Or perhaps we can ask the, uh, an easier question, namely, where will you be this week? <laughs> During this sacred time of remembrance on Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, will you go with Jesus to the garden? Will you stand with him beside his cross? Will you hang with him even as the going gets tough? In fact, it was Jesus himself who said famously, the one who is faithful in a small thing will also be faithful in a big thing. And so perhaps we can start there with a small thing, unless for you a small thing is a big thing too. Hanging with Jesus when the going gets tough. Let us pray. Well, Lord Jesus, you said it. Well, if the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I don't suppose if we struggle with doing things for you that pose an inconvenience that we should expect that we would do anything greater. But you've done everything for us. I mean, what didn't you do? What didn't you give? And the greatest thing about love is to love and return. Help us to love you the way you love us. With every fiber of your being, or as Brennan Manning said so famously, Jesus loved you so much he'd rather die than live without you. Lord, we pray, bring us to the place where we can't live without you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.